This week on World Stories. Turkey, silencing the media. Gaza, US aid put on hold. But first to the southernmost part of Eastern Europe, Chechnya. Lying at the foot of the Caucasus Mountains, this already volatile republic has of late become a fertile recruiting ground for so-called Islamic State. Grozny is not only the geographical center, but also the heart of Chechnya. After a debilitating war in the 90s, it was rebuilt with money from Moscow. Nowadays, the city seems peaceful, but appearances can be deceiving. Chechnya has become a hot spot of religious fanaticism since ISIS began searching for new recruits here. High unemployment, social discontent and soured hopes drive many in the region towards one of the most perverse forms of Islam and into the hands of the jihadists. Jihadists are sowing on fertile ground in Chechnya, despite near-total state surveillance and despite Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov's demonstrations of allegiance towards Putin and the Kremlin. In the last few years, whole families left for Iraq and Syria. They will be coming back, now that victory over ISIS has been declared. A key step in containing militants returning home would be to prevent young people from joining the terrorist organization in the first place. Despite a series of military defeats, ISIS is still recruiting fighters, primarily among young people. So the government is focusing on prevention. In this vocational school in Grozny, mothers of AS militants warn young people of the dangers of jihadi recruitment. Their children were around the same age as these students when they left for Syria. I love my fellow Chechens. In the name of Allah, I am a patriot. But I want to warn you about what happened to me. My daughter and her husband left to join ISIS. Her husband is dead and there's no trace of my daughter. Her story hits home. It's the first time we're talking about it so openly here at school. Why? I don't know. Probably because we're all afraid to talk about it. What are you afraid of? That we'll go to sleep one night and when we wake up our brothers will have left to join ISIS. No one can see it coming. Do you know anyone who is with them? No, and I don't want to have anything to do with them. Everyone says you'll find paradise if you go, but that's not true. Paradise can only be where your mother lives. Thousands of Chechens had a different opinion. They sought paradise in acts of terror. But their path is leading them home. For their families, they are husbands and sons. For the government, though, they are terrorists and murderers. To Turkey now. In the wake of the attempted coup in 2016, the authorities clamped down on the media. Hundreds of journalists have been imprisoned, many still awaiting trial. Reporter Chanan Choskun has been following their cases. This report from Istanbul. At breakfast, Chanan Choskun is already checking to see if there have been any more arrests. For years, the 30-year-old has worked as a court reporter, covering the trials of her colleagues. I check if other journalists were imprisoned. Since the police weren't at my place at 5 a.m., they could have struck somewhere else. <laughs> she hasn't lost her sense of humor. Without it, she says she wouldn't be able to last in her job. She reports from the heavily guarded Palace of Justice in Istanbul, the place where freedom of press in Turkey came to an end. <laughs> Every day when I walk over to this place, I see this building as some kind of enormous monster awaiting me with an ugly grimace. Cameras are not allowed in the courthouse, so from this point we record with a hidden cell phone. Today, she attends another case against colleagues of the daily paper, Jumhuriyat. The accusation, betraying state secrets. Few other reporters are present. Trials against journalists have become part of a sad routine in Turkey. The coverage of the trial itself is obstructed by the courts. 
basın sonra alınacak deniliyor, almıyor. They say there's no place for the press. The building is huge, but the courtrooms are very small. The smallest rooms are always selected for these important trials. No more than 20 to 25 visitors can fit into them. Once I had to report on a trial in one room while I was a defendant in another, so I had to walk back and forth. This time, Shashkun's colleagues walk free, at least for the time being. After two hours, attorneys and defendants come out of the courtroom after the trial is postponed for two months. Shashkun sends a copy of the court's decision to her paper. Outside, in front of the courthouse, the lawyer for the journalists describes the repeated postponements of the trial as a tactic to keep the defendants under pressure. Shashkun and her colleagues are watched and filmed by the police the entire time. Three of her colleagues are currently in prison and dozens of accusations are pending. The editors fight to survive and Shashkun knows that she could be indicted at any time for her court reporting. In Turkey, there is no system of law that protects the rights of individuals. Entire groups in society have been declared enemies, and their rights are just taken away. And the world would not be aware of this if Shanan Shoshkun didn't get up every morning to report from the inside of Istanbul's Palace of Justice. For over a decade now, the Gaza Strip has been cut off from both Israel and Egypt, and the people who live there have come to depend on handouts from the United Nations. The US decision this week to freeze payments to the agencies concerned has caused alarm. Several generations of refugees and their descendants live here under one roof in the Deir al-Bala refugee camp. And all are registered with the UN refugee agency, UNRWA. If they cut aid, what will happen to the Palestinian people? This aid is really important to us. If they create a state for us, we might find a solution to this situation. Although Shadi, her eldest son, is working in a clothing store, he barely makes a living. Every other month, he picks up the basic food ration for his small family. He says it covers 80% of their needs. If they reduce their aid, if they reduce their support for this humanitarian organization, it will be difficult and it will have serious consequences. People will suffer from more poverty, poverty will create violence, and violence will create an explosion. More than half of the two million people living in Gaza are dependent on support from UNRWA or other agencies. At the food distribution center in the Shati refugee camp, people are bracing themselves for an even harder time. Every three months, they pick up their ration of oil, lentils, flour, and other items. If we don't receive our ration, we might all just die. My next one is due in 10 days' time. But I went earlier, because we don't have any flour at home. I have seven children, and they need to eat. They don't know if their father has work or not. Many here say they feel caught in a political game that's likely to harm vulnerable people the most. Malaysia's energy requirements are mostly met by exploiting traditional sources, coal, oil and natural gas. But young entrepreneurs are pushing hard to get the country to make more use of solar energy for a cleaner world. The people of Poskadong aren't hooked up to the electrical grid, even though they live just four hours from the capital, Kuala Lumpur. Ten years ago, the Malaysian government installed solar panels here, but few of them are still working. That's why Gurpreet Singh has come to the village. Around four years ago, he founded the social enterprise firm BGBG. It gives workshops to village residents that train them in how to repair the technology. 
Then the lights and small appliances here will work again. I think we're going to see if she learned what we taught at the workshop. Let's see. Most of the village residents can't afford the spare parts that the BGBG team has brought with them from the capital. They're financed by donations and crowdfunding drives. Electricity for all. The company has taken on responsibilities usually assumed by the state. We can take initiative to make the change, to be the change that we want to see. It's sometimes when there's a problem, it just takes a little bit of action. And that action is definitely lacking, not only in this village, I'd say all around the country in different ways and forms. Malaysia now consumes around five times the energy it did back in 1990. It's a developing country with a burgeoning population that's hungry for products like air conditioners. That's where Azrina Yusuf's company comes in. It converts conventional air conditioning units to consume 50% less electricity. The exact method is still a trade secret. The technology hasn't yet been given all the necessary patents. But Yusuf has already landed big customers, like this Echo Resort. The way that uh, we have uh, positioned this as also as a, as a green product uh, is also um, to create that particular niche for our, our market because the awareness is beginning to grow now. And other potential customers from the U.S. have also come knocking. The energy-saving air conditioners made in Malaysia might soon become a mainstream product.